And um, in, our, in, this, in this study, we've, as we've gone through the book of Judges, we've seen some crazy things in this book. I mean, we, we've seen, obviously, the idolatrous hearts of the people of God who keep turning back to false gods over and over and over again. And we're going to see that again today. We've seen the danger of what happens when everyone does what's right in their own eyes. What happens when people just say, you know what, this is my deal, and leave me alone, I'm going to make my own decisions, and I'm just going to do what's right in my own eyes. We've seen the reality of the need for a spirit-empowered leader ruling our hearts. That's really what the book of Judges is crying out for. It's saying we need a spirit-empowered leader, and ultimately the writer is saying we need one from the tribe of Judah because he's trying to point ahead that David's going to be the true king. But when we look at this from biblical history, we're saying actually the one who's to come from the tribe of Judah that's the king we need is Jesus. And we've been seeing that throughout this study. But we've also seen, this is my favorite portrait that we've looked at in the book of Judges, is this portrait of the long-suffering God who loves his people so deeply that the moment they cry out to him, God shows up on the scene to rescue them. We've literally seen God rescuing his people on every page of this book. And I think that's been really, really helpful. So the next two weeks, we're going to look at the life of Gideon. And here's how we're going to do this. Um, there are so many lessons about Gideon and this story. We're going to just, we're going to break it in two parts. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to look first at the important people in this story and kind of glean some lessons from them today. That's what we're going to do first. We're just going to kind of pull out of, the, of this, and we're just going to pick sections of the chapters, chapters 6 through 8, and just look at some things that we can learn specifically from Gideon. And then secondly, next week, we're going to look at this amazing victory over these people, the Midianites, who the Bible says they were locust-like. They'd come in and they would devour everything the people of God had harvested, and they were just cleaning it, you know, just, just literally cleaning off their land and taking all their stuff for themselves. So next week we're going to look at that amazing victory that God utilized 300 men to conquer thousands of Midianites. And we're going to look at that picture next week. But for this week, we just want to dive into these important uh, people. There's a lot of people here that we want to look at, but I've just picked out a couple that I think are uh, really kind of stand out to us. Okay, so let's pray because we're going to God's Word and we want to just hear from the Lord today. Father, we we just pause again because we need you. We pause because you're our God and we need you to open our eyes. We pause because, Lord, apart from you revealing yourself to us, we won't know anything about you. So would you illumine our minds as we just sang about? Would you open our eyes to see Jesus? Would you... As well, Lord, help us to see ourselves, to see ourselves in light of the wonder of Christ. And just stir us today. Lord, uh, you know my frame, you know my need. Meet us today. Meet all of us today. Many are tired. Some are going through some really difficult things at home. Some have gone through great success this week. But may we pause here for these moments and just look to Jesus And may you be glorified as we study. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the next two weeks, we're going to look at uh, chapters 6 through 8. And what my hope is that by the time we get through next week, we're we're going to have all of it covered. Right? So this week, we're just going to pull out some things about uh, in this book. And I want to first look at idolatrous Israel. I want to look at these people. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, look with me at Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And then we're going to skip down to verses 7 through 10, okay? So Judges 6, verse 1, reads this way. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Now go down to verse 7. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to them, to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you into the, gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. Now we see this. Same theme that we've seen over and over again in this book. The people of Israel, again, 
doing what's evil in the sight of the Lord, again giving themselves to these false idols that are in their land, and the Lord again giving them into the hands of another enemy. This time it's Midian. Midian is this big army. It's intriguing as we're going to study next week and we'll learn more about him. This is actually um, Moses' father-in-law's nation. So it's kind of an intriguing tie-in here, but you're going to notice that they're going to be these people that they call them locusts. They come in and devour the land, anything in their path. They just, they just eat and take away. Um, and so God gives them over for seven years. And here's Israel doing this again. I mean, we could sit back, can't we? And just, I mean, we're in the sixth chapter and we've seen this already now four times. Over and over and over again, this thing keeps happening. The pattern of the people of God turning themselves over to false idols. Now, there's a big difference in this story than what we've seen previous. In this story, you'll notice in verse 8 that God sends a prophet to them. He sends this prophet speaking on behalf of God, and he seems to be just as shocked as we are to read this again. He seems to be like, are we going to go through this one more time? And he's declaring some things from God and letting them know. And you'll notice the things he says to him. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm the God who delivered you from slavery. I'm the God who delivered you from all who have oppressed you. And I gave you one commandment. Don't fear the gods of this land and don't idolize them. And what have you done? You have done exactly as I told you not to do. You've not listened nor have you obeyed. Now I just want to stop here and glean something from this, because I think it's, it's intriguing that the, the text kind of pauses, which I think we ought to as well, because I want to glean something right off the bat. These are God's people. This was the nation that, that God had delivered from Egypt, yet these were people who were in the situation with Midian because of their own sin. We've got to keep that in mind here. God is coming with an accusation. This is like a lawsuit. God's saying to them, you are the people. You are here in this predicament because of your own sin. And as we'll see in just a minute when we discuss Gideon, our natural tendency when things go bad or when things don't go our way is to blame God or other people. Isn't it? You'll see this with Gideon's life in just a moment. As humans, we have always, always done this. I mean, can't you see this in your own home? I mean, your kids get into a fight and you walk in and say, who did it? And they immediately pointing the finger at one another. You know, who let the dog in the house? And they're just po- looking around at one another. Who did not flush the toilet? And the kids are all pointing fingers everywhere. I mean, you get all these accusations everywhere. We are just as bad. We do the very same thing. We, we do not want to take personal responsibility for our sin, but rather we would rather point the finger at somebody else. Adam and Eve did this at the very beginning. God shows up and he asks Adam, why are you in this predicament? And what did Adam say? Well, the woman you gave me, Lord. (laughs) And how many husbands are still using that excuse, right? He goes to the woman, why did you do this? And she says, well, the serpent, you know, he tempted tempted me. You see it later as well in the, the high priest Aaron, when Moses is up on the mountaintop and he's worshiping God for 40 days. He comes down and Aaron has... You know, the people said, make for us a God. And he says, well, give me all your gold. And he fashions this golden calf. When Moses comes and confronts him, do you know what Aaron says? He says, well, the people made me do it. He says, we threw gold in this pot and out popped this calf. What's he doing? He's doing what we've done from the beginning. We blame shift from the beginning. Our natural tendency is the blame game. And I want you to just pause for a moment in the story of Gideon and just notice this. God comes pointing the finger. God comes saying, this is your fault. Let's make sure where this is at. We are the ones who got ourselves into this mess because of sin. But there's something else you can't miss in this. And what you'll notice is, notice how often God in that section speaks about his deliverance of his people. See, what you'll notice something that's beautiful about the scripture is that every time God brings up his people's sin, he always has an eye toward the Savior coming. He always has an eye toward deliverance. We can't miss this, that in the midst of God, accusing his people and making them realize this is your fault. You're in this predicament with Midian because of your own sin. God reminds them that he is the God of deliverance. So friends, listen, no matter what your current situation is that maybe you have caused, there is a God who can save you 
and save you in your sin. There is a God who will redeem you from your sin. Yes, sin has got you where you are, and it's your personal sin. But he's the God who delivered the Israelites from the greatest power on earth at the time, Egypt, and he's saying in a sense to us, I can also deliver you from the greatest power ever known to man, sin, and Satan himself. God delivers us from the power of our own sin, even though, listen, it's our personal responsibility for being in it. If that doesn't show the grace and mercy of God, we, I don't know what does. Right off the bat, we must see this. We must see that our sin is the problem, not our circumstance. See, getting, as you're going to notice in a minute, is pointing at a circumstance. This is all bad. Where is God? And in a sense, the prophet's saying, Gideon, God's been right here the whole time. It's your sin that's got you here, but there is a God who will and can deliver you. We must reconcile, we must see our own sin as the problem, not our circumstances, see that God is the only deliverer. So start there. Just glean that here as we move forward. Now jump in with me to verses 11 through 18 as we're introduced to this guy named Gideon. He is a perplexing character. If you, if you read anything about Gideon and it doesn't bring some paradoxical complexity to you, you're not reading it right. He is a complex guy and very difficult to get your fingers and your brain wrapped around. And we'll see this as we, as we go. Verses 11 through 18, let's read that together. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat near the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? You see Gideon's doubt here. You see his fear, his concern. But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. You see where he's pointing the finger? This is God's problem. Verse 14, And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, if I've now found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. And please not to depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. Now notice something about this section that is really remarkable. Is you'll notice that the Lord sees Gideon different than how Gideon sees himself. And even as you read the story of Gideon, you're going you're gonna to be amazed that God sees Gideon like this but yet, as you just read, Gideon isn't like this at all. I mean, notice verse 12, the angel of the Lord calls him a mighty man of valor, right? I'm a big Three Stooges fan. I know that sounds weird. I grew up watching the Three Stooges. And there's one of the scenes in the Three Stooges where uh, this man walks and the Three Stooges are all standing there side by side. They're waiting for this gentleman to come in the door. The guy opens the door and he says, hi, gentlemen. And they all turn around and look. And they're just staring around. I can picture Gideon. This guy walks up. This angel shows us. Hail, mighty man of valor. And Gideon just goes, Who, who's that? Why well, don't I see it? Oh, you're talking to me. I can just see this picture happening here. This angel sees Gideon way different than Gideon sees himself. Verse 14, notice this. Just after Gideon questioned the reality of God, accused God for the, sake, for the, the state they're in, and the reality of God's care, notice what the Lord says to him. Go in this might of yours. What does that mean? He didn't declare any might here. He declared doubt, fear. He questioned God's care. He questioned God's promise. He questioned God's protection. He questioned God's providence. He questioned God's sovereignty. And what is he doing here? He's not walking in any sense of might. But what is the Lord doing? The Lord is seeing Gideon different than he sees himself. This should be very refreshing to us. Hey, Nathan, can you sit up, buddy? Thank you. All right, good. Sorry about that. Here's a very refreshing thing to consider. God sees us far differently than we see ourselves. The Lord saw Gideon not in light of what Gideon had done or how he thought of himself. He saw Gideon in light of what God was doing in Gideon. 
This is important because we love to define ourselves by our labels. We love to define ourselves by our failures, our successes, our awards. I mean, you name it. Go to any dinner table, maybe you'll be there today at lunch, and just sit around and listen as people define themselves by their subtitles. Hi, I'm Dave York. What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, subtitle number one. What else do you do? I coach varsity baseball. And co- Great, here's another subtitle. What have you done so far? Well, I graduated from, and we begin this subtitle list of things that we begin to build a resume before people. What are we doing? We're just defining ourselves. Nothing necessarily wrong with it, but what I want you to notice is we define ourselves by these moments of life, and here's what's happening in this story off the bat that we can't miss. The Lord is saying those who trust in Jesus as their Savior, God does not see them the way they define themselves, and God does not see them in their failure, nor does he see them in their success. God sees them in Christ. They see them on the basis of Jesus Christ in his righteousness and in his strength. So Christian, listen, you're not a screw up. You're not a miserable sinner. You're not a wretched person in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, you are holy, blameless, and above reproach. You're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. And God sees you before him, not how you see yourself or even by what you've done or didn't do. God sees you on the basis of Christ. That is remarkably refreshing. To know that then when I go live my life, I'm not doing it for status before God because God already sees me in Christ. Because this is important in Gideon's life because Gideon is a confusing guy. He's very confusing. And you'll see this as we go. I mean, you'll notice when you read Gideon's story, he was a remarkably fearful and a remarkably doubting man. I mean, do you, do you see Gideon in this, this part we just read? And don't you relate to him? I mean, just put yourself in his situation, all right? So here's what's happening in his town, in his nation. The Midianites have come in. They've taken over to such a degree that everything they plant in the ground is the moment it shows any fruit harvest. The Midianites come in and just completely take it away. And when we find Gideon, we find him hidden in a secret wine press trying to glean a few grapes to take home to his family that he's had to hide in a cave so the Midianites don't take his own kids. And this lasts for seven years. Seven years. I mean, we can't hardly, we wouldn't stand this for seven days. Would we not doubt? Would we not be frustrated? Would we not be a little irritated and wonder where is God in all this? I mean, you can see it, can't you? Verse 13, where is God? Where are his great deeds? Sure, he did stuff in the past, but it's not anymore. And we see Gideon's story and his doubt all the way throughout the entire story of Gideon until we get to a certain section which makes us really pause with Gideon's life. Notice verse 15 of chapter 6. After the Lord said he'd be with Gideon, Gideon doubts. Verse 17 of chapter 6. After the Lord said he'd be with Gideon, Gideon needs a sign. Why does he need a sign? I don't know you're really going to do this. Look at verses 25 through 27 with me in, in, chapter, in Judges chapter 6. Judges 25, the Lord commands Gideon to do something. So he says, that night, the Lord, Judges 6 verse 25, said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, which that should make us pause for a minute, the major place for cultic worship in the land of Israel at this time was Gideon's dad's home. We'll talk about that next week. That's terrifying in itself. And he says, and he goes on to say, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, verse 26, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants And did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. You see what we're seeing about Gideon? He is a terrified man. Look at verses 36 through 40 and notice something else. This is a famous story of the fleeces. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool On the threshing floor, if there's dew on the fleece alone, it is dry on all the ground, 
that I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And it was so. And when he arose early in the morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. You'd think, that's enough, he's got it. No. Verse 29, verse 39. Then Gideon said to the Lord, let not your anger burn against me. Please let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece, but let it be dry on the fleece only and on the ground let there be dew. And, he, and God did so that night and it was dry on the fleece only and on the ground there was dew. Why is Gideon needing this? He's needing it because he doubts. He's a guy who is doubting God. He's doubting God's word to him. But there's another story that even shows even farther Gideon's fear. And it's found in Judges chapter 7. Now to put Judges chapter 7 in context here, you need to know what's going on. This is the after the Lord has called Gideon, after the Lord is protecting him from getting killed by those guys that he tore down their Baal altars. This is after the Spirit of the Lord has empowered him. This is after 32,000 men have come from all over Israel to follow him. And this is after God has pared down that army to 300 men. So you'd think at this moment, Gideon's kind of got it that God's with him. You'd think that there would be no reason to be afraid. But then read Judges 7, verses 9 through 11. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down to the camp, for I've given Midian into your hand. But if you're afraid to go down... Go down to the camp with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Purah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Did you catch what God said to him? Hey, if you're afraid still, go down to the camp and hang out outside it, and look at the end of verse 11. Thus Gideon went down. What's that tell you about Gideon? He was still afraid. Gideon is still nervous about the fact that God's going to do all of this. And so he goes down to the outside of this, you know, this camp to listen with his servant because he's afraid. Now I find this really refreshing because it shows us, doesn't it? God using fearful, doubting people and infusing them with faith. I, f I find it very refreshing. Isn't this like us? I mean... I don't know many of us that walk into situations with this brash attitude, we got it covered. I find more of us saying, I really don't know how to handle this situation. I'm a little nervous and my palms are getting sweaty and I'm not quite sure how what I should do here if the Lord's going to give me wisdom on what to do. What I love about this story is God wanted his people delivered and he didn't use Sylvester Stallone. I love that. He used a guy like us, fearful, doubting, and needing constant reassurance. Don't you get this picture of like, you know, Gideon standing on the edge of the pool and God saying, just come jump in. And Gideon's like, I, I don't, Lord, I don't, Lord, I don't know if you're going to catch me or not. And God said, no, no, really just, just come in. And finally the Lord just kind of jumps out of the water and pulls him into the water with him. That's what it feels like in the story. Friends, you might wonder if God is angry at you because of your fears. Listen, he's not angry with you because he knows your fears. He saved you because of your fears and in spite of your fears. And you might wonder if God will ever help you in the moment of your need for strength. And Gideon's story tells you he will. Why? Why does God do this? Well, look with me at verse 15 when Gideon gets this word. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped. Isn't that beautiful? It doesn't say that he just suddenly gathered all the guys and then went. It says, no, he worshiped, then he gathered all the guys and went. See, here's, here's the beauty of this. This is why God strengthens fearful, doubting, seemingly weak people. It's so that we will step back and marvel that God is the one who did it all. God is the one who opened the door. God is the one who pushed us out the door. God is the one to strengthen us to get the job done. All the way through this, what do you see? God saying to Gideon, if you're afraid, here's a word. If you're afraid, here's a sign. If you're afraid, here's a dream. If you're afraid, there's the enemy. Go right down by the tent, and you're going to hear them talking. And what does God do every time he meets Gideon? And the beauty of this is so that we might step back and worship this great God who's on our side, knows our fearful frame, and listen, sees us in Christ. That's what's beautiful about it. Why is God infusing Gideon with faith? Because in God's eyes, he's a mighty man of valor. 
And believe that, listen, in your moment of greatest fear, whatever he calls you to do, he will strengthen your hand and your heart to do it. This is a great God we serve, folks. Don't miss what he's doing here. But Gideon's story doesn't end with his fear because we see something begin to develop that's really perplexing. We actually see Gideon become strangely proud. This has been a sobering part of Gideon's story for me all week. It has just been something that has been just eating me alive. Here's the reality of what we see with Gideon. God does strengthen him with courage, and God brings a crazy victory. I mean, what's, what's funny about the life of Gideon is God tells him to go down there, and he's going to give Midian into their hands, but he tells him that the, the battle strategy, let me just check, is to wave torches blow trumpets, and break pots. From the outside at midnight. Um, that's not your most courageous battle strategy. Right? You, you actually, in your mind, probably think Gideon's 300 men as the movie 300. You know, these 300, you know, Spartans just, you know, manning up and going at it. That's not what you see here. You're not, you don't have the 300 Spartans here. What you have is some guys on the outside and Gideon says, you know, this is what we're going to do. And I'm sure all the guys are singing, and th this is the way that deliverance is going to happen? And they do it, you know, bam, you know, clay pots crash and torches and they shout, this big shout, and they're all around the whole thing. And because of the darkness of night, God causes massive confusion in the Midianite army. They go to kill one another and they take off running. And then Gideon and his guys just kind of follow them. You know, ah, you know, with their broken clay pot in their hand. And it just seems like the type of strategy a non-courageous guy would do. It, it is perplexing. God does bring this massive victory about. But notice something that Gideon does and wants them to shout that tells us something's changing here. Notice verse 18 of, of Judges chapter 17. Or excuse me, Judges chapter 7. <laughs> Judges 7 verse 18 Look what Gideon says to them. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts, when I come to the outskirts, I'm looking at verse 17, sorry. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, verse 18, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Uh-oh. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches, their right hands the trumpets to blow, and they cried out. Now check this. This is really funny. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Wait a minute. Okay. In their left hand they got the jar. In their right hand they got the torch. Where's the sword? It's in their belt. A sword for God and for Gideon. What's, go what's going on here? Something is happening that's going on. D Gideon is moving from fearful doubter to a man more concerned with his own glory than the glory of God. Now, here's what, I'm, what you're going to notice as we finish up this story. From this point on in the story, Gideon takes a bigger role in the story and God takes a smaller role in the story. It, it is strange. The more Gideon is talked about, the less God is talked about. And we're going to look at this as we get to chapter 8. Because as chapter 8 begins, you have this group of people, we'll call them the jealous Ephraimites. They are people of God, and they're basically upset with this. They're basically upset that Gideon did not pick them to go into battle with the Midianites. You know what this is? This is that um, you know backyard baseball game that you pick, you know, you have captains to pick, and you then choose somebody, and your friend gets upset that you did not choose them as a first-round draft pick. Or they don't get picked at all, and these people who aren't picked are a little ticked off, and they're kind of angry, and they're, they're like, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. Why would you go to battle against the Midianites and not pick us? That's what's happening here. Now, you'd think Gideon would kind of step back and say, hey, man, this was the Lord's work, man. I mean, I, I, I mean, did Gideon pick the 300 guys? No, the Lord did. But look at Gideon's reply in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 8. It should take you by surprise. Then the men of Ephraim said to him, What is this that you've done to us? 
not to call us when you went to fight with Midian. And they accused him fiercely. And he said to them, what, uh, what have I done now in comparison to you? See what he's saying? Oh you, guys, oh, you guys are the ones that went out to battle, right, and won this thing? Look what else he goes on to say. Is not the gleaning of the grapes in Ephraim better than the grape harvest of my father, Abiezar? God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. What have I done to be able, what, what, have, what have I been able to do in comparison with you? Sure, it says their anger against him was subsided at this point because Gideon was turning his anger toward them. But this, this story gets even farther. It gets even scarier because what you notice about Gideon in these first three verses of chapter 8 is, wh where's the Lord here? Gideon is bragging about his own heritage, his own victory, his own exploits, and who are they to question him? He's, he's the man who brought the victory of the day. But it gets worse in chapter four or chapter 8, verses 4 through 9. Read that with me. And Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over. He and the 300 men who were with him exhausted yet pursuing. <clears throat> so he said to the men of Succoth, Please give us loaves of bread to eat for the people to follow who follow me, for they're exhausted, and I'm, I'm pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. <clears throat> and the officers, officials of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hand that we should give you give bread to your army? So Gideon said, well then, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zamuna into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Hmm. Verse 8. And from there he went up to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth answered. And he said to the men of Penuel, when I come again in peace, I will break down your tower. Their tower is like this big thing in their town. You know, it's like their, their, their rallying point, if you will. And what you notice is happening is Gideon now is angry that people are not recognizing what he has done for Israel and he's demanding from them what he asks. Feed us. We've done this. You feed us. Now, should have those men have fed him? Sure they should have. But they don't. And notice the terrifying results in verses 16 and 17 in Judges chapter 8. Verse 16, he says, And he took the elders of the city of Succoth and took thorns of the wilderness and briars and with them taught the men of Succoth a lesson. Now that sounds to us, that sounds really funny. Like, you know, man, he took these men out and just kind of embarrassed them. They deserve it. No, this is an arrogant, arrogant, arrogant man who is now take, using his own power to dictate and dominate over people for the purpose of embarrassing them. But then verse 17, and he broke down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of that city. Now, what, you know why this is terrifying? This is the first time in the book of Judges where we see Israelite on Israelite at war with one another. And it all happens because of pride. The men of Succoth certainly should have fed him. The men of Penuel certainly should have fed him, but they didn't because they didn't want to take part of God's war effort. The men of Gideon are jealous. They're proud because they didn't get chosen to be a part of Gideon's army. And certainly it's pride on Gideon's part for bragging about his exploits rather than God's. Here's what's happening. Pride causes Gideon to go from coward to hero to glutton for the glory of God. He begins to, he cannot get enough glory. And isn't this what pride does? Pride takes credit where God worked. Pride craves the applause of men. Pride wants glory. And friends, pride always, always divides and always, always destroys. I'm reminded of James chapter 4 where James says to us, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you. You want something, you don't get it, so you murder, you fight. What is that? It's pride. This is pride at work. Pride always, always ends with war with others. We see it here in Gideon, and we'll see it in our own lives. But Gideon's pride doesn't stop here, which is, which is really sad. You'd think that at some point Gideon kind of get it. You know, he'd kind of say, man, guys, we got to step back now. We're, we're fighting with our own people right now. We're kind of getting, we got a lot of infighting happening. We're biting and devouring one another. We got to stop this, but that's not what happens at all. 
Look in Judges chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, and you'll see something intriguing. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your grandson, your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. It's a good question. It's a good comment. Gideon, you've done all this. We need you to come save us. Gideon seems to reply in humility in verse 23. I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. That sounds really humble, doesn't it? Until you read the rest of the story. Notice down in verses 30 and 31, something that kind of just pops up as we end Gideon's life. Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son and he called his name Abimelech. This seems like no big deal. But here's what's happening. Gideon made a say out of his mouth, I don't want to be your king. But in his heart, he wanted to be king because he's already living like a king. But to top it all off, do you know what Abimelech means? My father is king. He named his son, my father is king. What do you think Gideon is saying here? Look, the Lord's going to rule over you but I'm kind of his chosen instrument. The Lord's going to be that guy over you, but you know, really, I want that position. But it even gets worse. Look at verses 24 through 28, and you'll see what Gideon does, which is one of his most tragic errors. And Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. This is right after he just said, the Lord will rule over you. Let me make a request of you. Every one of you, Give me the earrings of a spoil. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they said to him, we will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak and every man threw in it the earrings of a spoil. And the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold beside the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an ephod of it. And he put it in, the, in his city in Orpha. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was, was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon. You see what Gideon does? This is the final nail in the proud coffin of Gideon. He makes an ephod out of idolatrous gold. Now an ephod, if you don't know, was a garment that was to be made out of fine linens. It was worn on the outside of the high priest's clothing, and it was used by the people of God to determine the direction of God. And it was only to be given to the priest, to the high priest. The ephod was one of a kind. It was only given to those who God had designated for such a role and such a position. To the high priest of the tribe of Levi, Gideon was not that. Yet here's Gideon fashioning his own ephod made of idolatrous gold, revealing that he really craves the position and the power that God has not given to him. And here's what we see. The applause of men had become more important to Gideon than the glory of God. Folks, this is what this is. This is truly a sad tale of a humble man turned proud at the end of his life. Gideon did not end well. He didn't end well. It's sad. He is a hero of the faith, and we can point to him and say, look, all these exploits are remarkable. Look what God did. It's pretty amazing because we see him again in, in Hebrews chapter 11, that he was a man of faith, that God sprung him in faith, strengthened him in faith, and then had this massive victory over the Midianites. But he did not end well. And that's what pride does. Pride causes us to crave positions that God does not call us to. Pride causes us to end poorly. Pride causes us to cling to power, position, and influence because we long for the applause of men more than the applause of God. Proverbs 16 nails this when it just simply said, pride comes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Pride never, never ends well. It's a sad story that ends, it should have been a victory, a, a victory song, but instead it ends with these sad, sad tales. Notice how the rest of the story ends in verses 30, in verse 27, and then verses 33 through 35 of Judges chapter 8. 
And Gideon made this ephod of it, made an ephod of it, and put it in a city in Orpha, in, Oph- in Ophrah, and all Israel whored after it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Now, 33 through 35, as soon as Gideon died, the people turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done in Israel. See, Gideon did good, didn't he? He delivered the people of Israel. The end of his life ends in this taking credit for what God had done. This is remarkable. And and we see in the beginning of chapter 6 when we noticed, what were the people doing in in the beginning of chapter 6? They were following again after these Baals. The sad truth is when you read Judges 8, 33-35 at the end of Gideon's life, they're actually worse off. Now they're not just going after Baals. They've also named a particular Baal to be their God. They have now forgotten God, and they've also forgotten the guy who delivered them. What I find intriguing here is Gideon, as he is pursuing this applause of people, when he dies, what happens? They don't even remember him. I find here some lessons, I think, to end just for leaders. I don't care what leadership position you're in. Family, business, church, wherever it is, in positions of leadership, I think there's some concerns we have to evaluate here. Gideon did not turn these people directly to the Lord over and over and over again. What's he doing? For the Lord and for, don't forget my name. Right? I, I, I did that. You ever find this whenever God answers somebody's prayer and we have to have that little addition? I prayed for that. Part of that in our heart is motivated by good. Some of it is to kind of say, can I take a little bit of credit? See, there's that. We have to guard this in our hearts. He seemed instead of turning the people to God to turn the people where? To him. See, this is what's terrifying. Over the last chapters we've just read, we've seen Gideon talk more about his exploits than what actually happened. Gideon begins to kind of reinvent the story a little bit. Yeah, sure, God had a part, but let me just remind you what I did. Don't, rem- don't forget my part. God brought about a, ga- a great victory, but Gideon is now taking credit for it. He loved the applause of men more than the glory of God. And at the end of his life, what happens? The people forgot. The very thing he craved, he lost. The very thing he enjoyed was no longer there. What's that tell us? The applause of men is temporary. It's temporary. It's always has been, always will be. And leaders, listen, in every sphere, I don't care where you're at, make it your aim to glorify God, point people to Him. His glory never fades, and He deserves it anyway. I mean, He gave you the ability to move, breathe, and exist, and He gave you the ability to make wealth, to lead. He gifted you to do all these things for what purpose? So at the end of the day, we might step back and say, this was God's work. This was God's work. But then there's also this lesson for followers. It's, it's a tragic tale for, a tale for these people in Israel. And followers would be for all of us. I've said throughout the book of our study of Judges that Judges helps us see that an earthly leader is important, but he's not enough. He's not enough. These people hoard after this ephod. That's an awful word, isn't it? They sold themselves for this ephod. They worshipped the ground that Gideon walked on. What's intriguing is Judges 6 begins with them worshipping the Baals. Judges 8, right before we get the death of Gideon, they're worshipping Gideon. They worshipped the ground he walked on. Instead of seeing Gideon as a gift from God, they viewed him as a God. That's big time danger. Listen, just like leaders should point followers to Christ and to God, listen, we as followers must always guard our hearts from making leaders into gods with a little g. This does not mean we don't need leaders, we don't need authority, because God, His word is clear, we do. It simply means this. Leaders and authorities are given by God to heighten our need and our dependence and our worship of the living God. Bad things happen to leaders and followers 
who worship the leader and the authority rather than the God who's given all of that. These people ended up being worse than when they started. So listen, for us as a church right now, this is what's been just resonating in my heart. And I've said, I said this at the beginning of the year. I'll say it again. We had a fabulous 2013. It is so important for us to keep Christ central in it all. In it all. We must make Christ our aim. We are not following a personality, a celebrity, uh, a style. We are following a Savior. We must keep that in mind. We must. Jesus must be our aim. So listen, put your trust in Christ as your leader. I, when I read this this week, and I've been going over for two weeks, and I've just been beaten down by, Lord, save us from Gideon's cycle. Save us from this end of the tale saying, oh, by the way, don't forget what we have done here. I want to get to the end and all of us say, to God be the glory. Let, let get to the end and say, he, he's the one we're more concerned about. And as followers, listen, turn our hearts to Jesus everywhere we go. Whatever, whatever he does, however he meets us, it's going to be miraculous and bizarre. And we go, where did this come from? We can't walk into any of that and say, well, it's because, you know, we kind of cut a deal. No, God did all of this. And step back at the end of the day and turn our hearts to him and to him alone, for he is the only one who can transform hearts, the only one who can transform lives, and the only one who is worthy of that un ending worship let's let's keep that clear keep it clear and and then the other thing that really struck me was this we all feel weakness to enter into the work of god and it's really easy to enter as a coward and finish as a glutton for glory because suddenly something happens when you go into it with fear god meets you things happen it's easy to say, and people go, wow, you did a great job there. It's easy to kind of go, I kind of like, like that. I like it when they pat me on the back. And to stop, to leave that sense of dependence and humility, and if you will, to some degree, fear. Let, let's, let's posture ourselves before Christ appropriately in this. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our worship team is going to come up and lead us but i just want to i just want to pray for us i father through this lesson of gideon and these people you've just continued to stir in me the need for recognizing that not many of us were wise not many of us were strong we would not be those that, that the world would look upon and say, boy, look, look at them. <clears throat> but you have chosen to bring down the things of the world that are strong and the things that are wise by us <laughs> and by the things that are foolish through the preaching of the gospel, through, through the work of the Holy Spirit, you're transforming lives in ways and places that, we, that just literally blow our minds. Father, I, I just pray that we'd posture ourselves appropriately, that, that as, as a psalmist wrote, not to us, O Lord, but to your great name be all the glory. Not to us, O Lord, but to your great name be all the glory. I, I think of families who have raised children and they're relatively successful. May these parents just look back and say, not to us, O oh Lord. I think of business leaders who are successful right now and things are happening in ways they've never dreamed. May they say, not to us, O oh Lord, but to your great name be all the glory. I think of athletes who have had great success this year among us. And I pray, Lord, they would just say, not to us, O oh Lord, but to your great name be all the glory. I, I think of our church as you are you're using us and there's people and lives are being affected as they've interacted with some of our folks. And Lord, we recognize that's a work of you. And we say, not to us, O Lord, but to your great name be all the glory. Lord, posture us appropriately. Oh, I, I, just, I just want this in my heart. I want it in us. 
And Lord, I don't want to brag about our humility. <laughs> I want us to be humble before you that just says, this is your work. You are at work. Let us marvel. Let us never step into pride. Give us grace where we are. Adjust us and correct us and help us see it for your great name. For your great name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So church, let's stand and sing appropriately worshiping the risen Savior.